there's Anthony. You can see him. I, I can see a preview. So thank you very much, Anthony, for accepting our invitation to give the annual lecture for this year. Professor Anthony Reddy is the director of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture at Regent's Park College in Oxford. Ah, that's why I wrote it down, you see. Um, <laughs> and the title on which he'll be speaking this evening is Unmasking the Two Ds, the Two Deadly Ds, Dismantling Whiteness and Deconstructing Mission Christianity. Thank you very much, Anthony. Oh, you know what? I'm supposed to uh, give you a microphone as well. We're a slick operation. Okay, I hope that you can hear me. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to give this lecture this evening. So what I propose to do in the next 30, 40 minutes or so is to outline two ongoing conversations that I have been thinking about for the last 35, maybe 40 years. It is a strange experience to find yourself having thought about issues for a long time that for the most part, most certainly white Christians have completely ignored until suddenly an African-American called George Floyd is murdered. And suddenly it's as if the broader sweep of Christendom suddenly catches up with something that some of us have been thinking about for a long time. In this talk, what I want to do is to talk about, well, first of it is to enflesh this notion of whiteness. And as I will say in a moment, it's not necessarily about white people, it's about a way of being in the world. A lot of this work owes a great deal to my friend, I say friend, maybe a stretch in a bit, maybe a kind of um, acquaintance slash friend, someone I meet at a conference from time to time, the great Willie James Jennings, who is an African-American post-colonial constructive scholar, who I think in 2009, I think, published a, a brilliant book called Christian Imagination, which he then followed up in 2020 with a book called After Whiteness. And in both books, really what Jennings does is begin to think constructively about the way in which this phenomenon of whiteness has so captured our imagination, but not captured it in a good sense, but has created a framework in which when we think about what it means to be human, it's a construct that has been incredibly hierarchical and has dominated the world as we have experienced it for the last millennia. And Christianity, that was meant to be an antidote to all of this has sadly been captured along with it. And part of the corrosiveness and the toxicity of the phenomenon of whiteness is because that most of us don't even see it, it becomes so normalized that it becomes almost self-evident within our experience of what it is to be human. And sadly, it took the murder of an African-American man and to be clear, people have been African American, well, people of African descent have been murdered for a lot longer than George Floyd. It just happened to be, he was caught on camera. And being caught on camera, it created a visceral response in a way that had perhaps not been the case for any of the millions of murders that have happened. And I say millions of murders, actually going right back to the epoch of slavery. Well, that's a bit abstract and a bit dry. So let me start with a story. I'm a storyteller. So let me start with where this starts for me. So as I said, this is not a new conversation. As you may have guessed, this is a Northern accent. I've lived for 36 years in Birmingham, but I've never lost the accent. And it's often said, you can take the man out of Yorkshire, but you can't take Yorkshire out of the man. So, so I would like to tell you that, that holding on to my accent has been a real act of resistance against the softening bourgeois confines of being living in the Midlands. And I can tell you it's an act of resistance as a 
working class socialist man who comes from the heart of Bradford. The truth is I just don't hear accents. And so I can guarantee you that when I hear this playback, a partner will think, oh my God, do I sound like that? I have no sense of how I sound. And so, the, and so holding on to the accent wasn't an act of any resistance. It's just that I just don't hear accents. So I still sound pretty much how I sounded when I left East Bowling in 1984 to come to Birmingham to read for a degree in history. A few years prior to leaving Birmingham, so 1982, I'm in lower sixth form doing my A level at Tong Comprehensive School. Now I use the word school in the loosest possible sense because it's more like a zoo than a school. <laughs> uh, last comprehensive inner city school, 2,500 kids there, of whom I would probably say 2,400 of them did not want to be there. I was part of a small group of bookish nerds who loved school and loved the idea of learning and loved homework. So you can imagine how popular I was, not very. But anyway, but as part of a small bookish group of kids. And I'm doing A-level English. And I love reading. I love engaging with literature. It actually was my first love before I did a degree in history. But I still remember this moment like it was yesterday. My English teacher, who I chart name because he's still around and he's a Facebook friend, so let me not get too specific about them. But one day, my English teacher comes to me and says, Anthony, I've come across a book that I think that you should read. Really important book. And he gives me a copy of Chinua Chebe's Things Fall Apart one of the first great African novels, I, think, I believe, published in 1958. And, and Achebe is writing about the change in face of Africa in the late 50s and talking about how modernity and what we now talk about post-colonialism is beginning to change the nature of African society. And so he's writing about that particular milieu. And the teacher says, Anthony, this is an important book for you to read. And the person that hits me was, as the only black boy, there were about 30 of us in the A-level English class, only two black people, myself and a, a black young woman. She wasn't in that class that day. So he came to me and, and he gives me the book and says, it's an important book for me to read. And at the time I think to myself, why is it important for me to read, but not for the rest of the class to read? But anyway, but I read the book and it's a brilliant book. Now, what struck me immediately that moment, which is a question I've wrestled with for almost 40 years since, was that I quickly deduced that it was an important book to me to read because Achinua Achebe is an African. And as someone who is black of African descent, clearly this is a book that's relevant to me. So it's a book I should read. But at the same time, doing A of English, I remember the same teacher loved Jane Austen. And we were doing a Jane Austen book for Ella, Emma. And I have to tell you, and I don't want to offend anyone, but I hated Jane Austen. This book said nothing to me whatsoever. I sat and I read it and I thought, but here's the question I thought, so why is it that only I need to reach into a chair bit? But every one of us has to read Jane Austen. Whether you like it or not, Jane Austen was on the curriculum and we had to read. And I thought, so what makes Jane Austen universal, but Chinua Chebe only particular for some people to read? What makes one person have generic universal insight, so irrespective of the context you come from, I'm pretty clear that when Jane Austen was writing her book, she never had me in mind, a black working class kid from the city of Black. Pretty sure she did, but I still got to read it. But Tinua Cherby was only important for me to read, so presumably all the other white kids in the class didn't need to read it. Age 16, well, 17, I didn't have the intellectual apparatus to make sense of that, but it quickly hit me 
that some people's contexts could be construed as universal and other people's contexts are very, very particular. So Austin is writing about a particular milieu that she's in at the time, it's provincial England. England in the midst of the slave trade, although that of course is never mentioned in any of her work. On the cusp of the industrial revolution, a great writer of social manners. I have to confess that my antipathy towards her has softened over the years. I, you know, I mean, I've seen many a BBC adaptation, probably on a Sunday night. I probably thought, ah, you know, maybe this woman could write a bit. Okay, you know, I mean, I will concede that she could tell a good tale. But I have to confess, I've never read any of the books because I'm still scarred of having to have read and reread Emma for Ayla. I'm convinced that, that my great burgeoning career as a great writer and literary critic was somewhat stalled by, stalled by the fact that I did so badly in my Ayla, which I blame. I blame entirely on Jane Austen. Um, that I abandoned that and went into history instead, church history that then morphed into theology. But ever since that moment, I've wondered, why is it that some people get to be universal and some people are particular? Years later, this was repeated when I began to do academic theology. So I then start church history and then from that morphed into doing theological studies at the University of Birmingham. And I remember again, one of the academics making us read the work of Karl Barth. Now I have to confess that I've come to dislike Barth even more than I ever disliked Jane Austen. And again, it was very clear to us that this was someone whose writings transcended the social context in which he wrote in order that he could make universal truths that everyone had to be irrespective of the context in which they were in, and one was reading their work. It's about that time, courtesy of Professor Robert Beckford, who had just been appointed as the first tutor in Black theology at Queen's College, then called Queen's College, the Queen's Foundation now, where I later ended up working. And he'd taken an introductory class to Christian studies with Robert Beckford, I came across the work of James Cobb, which literally changed my life. But at that point, it was interesting that Cohn was not in the curriculum as someone everyone had to read. Cohn was on this particular discrete course for people who were doing extramural studies. I wasn't a student at Queen's per se, I was someone who was coming in on a Tuesday afternoon for this particular class of Black Christian Studies that Robert Beckford was running for the small number of Black audience and people from the community who had an interest. So Cohn was very much part of a discrete study for a small group of Black students. Because clearly there was nothing in his work that had universal application compared to Karl Barth. At this point, I'm a bit older and a bit more critical. And I've got a few, and I've got a better apparatus for being able to reflect and deconstruct this. And I remember arguing with the tutor in the college who taught doctrines to why Cohn wasn't on the curriculum. And his words were roughly, well, Cohn has important things to say about racism, but his work lacks universal application for all people. Which seemed a bit rich, given the fact that if you know anything about Birmingham and where the college is set, which is in one of the most leafiest and expensive parts of Birmingham, where at the time, it's changed enormously now, but at the time, if you were walking in that area in the evening, it wasn't uncommon for a police officer to stop you and ask you what you were doing walking in that area, because somehow black people should only be living in Hansworth or Borsal Heath, but Lord, never in Edgebaston or Harbour. So it's somewhat ironic that one could be stopped on the pres presumption of racism, but James Cohn had nothing to say to white society. From those two encounters, I pretty much spent 
the best part of the last 25 years actually wrestling, actually wrestling with those two questions. So why is it that some people get to be universal and some people are marginalized? If we read them at all, then they're particular for some people to read, but not for everyone. And they're never compulsive on a curriculum. And the truth is the reason why is because whiteness becomes the, the definition of what is construed as true. And, and when I say whiteness, I mean, if we're thinking in particularities, and I'll unpack this in a moment, we're really talking about white cis men of empire. That whiteness is exemplified particularly in terms of the construction of people who have created a sense of the conceptual norms of how we think about ideas of truth, epistemology in philosophical terms. It's, it's a way of mastery and control. It's a way of being able to define the world and name it in terms of a position that puts you at the center and then names everyone else, but never names yourself or names the people who are propagating that knowledge in the first place. It's a way of seeing and being in the world. Whiteness exists as almost this invisible, this invisible framework in which all of us live, in which all of us have been caught up with. The best example of that, in terms of analogy, I believe actually comes from Winnie James Jennings, who says, well, imagine that all of us are fish in the sea. The sea becomes what is normal to us. And actually, the only time you realize there's something odd about your existence is when you're taken out of the sea. If you're caught in a net and pulled into fresh air, then suddenly most fishes, if you're not a mammal, will suddenly realize, oh, actually something strange here. But whilst you're in the sea, and if you're a fish, it's so normal that most, I would imagine that most fish actually don't give it a second thought. That, says Jennings, is how whiteness operates. It's so normative that most of us don't see it. So it's why we have, for example, in terms of theology, but in, but in terms of literature, ways of naming things that are deemed to be particular and the other. So we have African literature, or we have black theology, or we have Latin American theology, we have post-colonial and contextual ways of thinking. And yet for the most part, white people are just the thing itself. So I still meet people who say, in my discipline of theology, what do you do? Well, I teach Christian theology. And you wanna say, so what kind of theology? They say, oh no, just theology. Because white theology is just theology. Jane Austen is never a white writer. She might be a woman, she might be a feminist writer, but she's just a writer. Her whiteness has no significance to the work she's doing, except for the fact that if she wasn't white, then she wouldn't be universal. So here's the odd paradox. Something that's not mentioned becomes universal and the norm. Not mentioned, not specified, but it becomes a norm against which everything else is then defined as particular and the other. Part of the power of whiteness is that because it doesn't need to be named, it doesn't have to specify itself, it then becomes a template on which we judge everything else. I still remember again seeing a documentary many, many years ago by one of the first critics of talk about this, a guy called Paul Gilroy, who in his very famous 1982 book, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, was the first one who began to outline the way in which Britishness and Englishness was predicated <coughs> on a form of classic whiteness. 
still exists. If you want to understand how three black footballers can get booed and get hate mail for missing a penalty, you need to understand that what authentic belonging looks like is a white skin. So belonging and a sense of acceptability is framed around whiteness because that's a historic norm of which empire and colonialism was constructed. Gilroy gives this example, I believe. I believe it's Gilroy. But it says that such is the power of whiteness, how it gets constructed, that like, you even find yourself in this odd example of going into a shop and looking to buy a plaster, and they say, well, like we have skin colored plasters. But whose skin is it? Not my skin. But of course, it never says it's white people's skin. It just says skin color. But actually, such is the power of norm that what they really mean is this is a plaster for the skin color that matters most in the world. Even though most people are not white. So part of where we're thinking about deconstructing curricula, where we're talking about sort of what vogue at the moment is a lot of conversations around how we think about decolonizing the curriculum. The first thing we have to do is, is at least to name whiteness, is at least to acknowledge that there is a conceptual framework that defines something as normative and other things as marginal. And at the very least to challenge, not necessarily to say everything that comes out of this conceptual norm is bad. That's not what we're saying. But at least to recognize that this phenomena has shaped the way in which so much of our academic discipline, particularly Christian theology, has been framed. And to recognize the potent ways in which that has created the world and how that has helped to shape people's experiences and their realities. I still remember, and apologies again for people who've heard this particular story of being age 11, I think, in the Methodist church in which I grew up in Bradford, large city center Christian church. And at the back of the church was a parlor, which was this large cold room where they put all the teenagers who were likely to be, not, uh, to be loud and disruptive and rebellious. So they put us all in the far room, far away from all the adults so we could make as much mischief as we wanted and not upset the nice, hot, polite, middle-class gavel of this particular church. And in the Sunday school class of which I was the only black child, was on the far wall a picture of Jesus who looked more like Bjorn Borg than Bjorn Borg looks like Bjorn Borg. But I'm glad that you all laughed because I made the mistake of trying that with some Oxford students a few weeks, a few months back. And of course I realized I'm a, a man of a certain age, when they're looking, you say, so who's Bjorn Borg? <laughs> it's like, oh, no, really? Like, you don't know who Bjorn Borg is? Well, of course they don't, you know. Way before their time. But anyway, <laughs> but obviously, but you lot don't got the joke. This was a very blonde-haired, Nordic-looking Jesus. Obviously, to say, had no relationship to the historical Jesus as a Palestinian Jew. But that's not the point. The point was, of course, this is the Jesus of empire. So, of course, he's white. This is the Jesus that, that is exported all across the empire. This is a conceptual norm. This is effectively what whiteness has done. The central doctrine of Christianity is that we're created in the image and likeness of God. But, of course, what whiteness does is to create God in its own image, not the other way around. So this Jesus has no basis in any historical fact, but that's not the point. It is a reflection of this particular privilege of whiteness. And I remember sitting, staring at this picture of Jesus. It's, it's one of those pictures where, where, where so wherever you went in the room, the eyes of Jesus followed you. So I remember our Sunday school teacher would say, I'm gonna leave the room, but I want you to behave because Jesus will be watching you. <laughs> and we all kind of quickly worked out that Jesus might be watching us, but he wasn't gonna do anything. 
which is probably an interesting theological question that I've asked many years since. What exactly is God doing in the midst of oppression and injustice? That's a whole other conversation about theology. We won't go there now. But certainly at the time, I remember thinking to myself, who was I in relationship to this Jesus? Very, very blonde, very blue eyed. And so I eventually summed up the courage and asked my, my Sunday school teacher, Miss, I said, if that is Jesus and that's the Son of God, and all of us are created in the image and likeness of God, then presumably we have a relationship to this Jesus. So who am I? And she thought for a second and said, well, it doesn't matter. And at one level, that kind of satisfied me because I could sense that in a church where the people were very loving and in a family that I'd grown up with my mother particularly, who always emphasized the love of God, that loved everyone, particularly those of us who were considered to be problems in the world and in society, God had special love for them. At one level, I did doubt it. But at another level, it was still a problematic statement because in a church where all the leadership were white, and where we don't do much iconography in low evangelical Methodism, but on the basis of the few pictures we and images we had, there were never people of color, never people from the global majority. It was always white. So saying it didn't matter when it clearly seemed to matter in that it wasn't until my late twenties that I saw a picture of a Jesus that was not white. And reinforced by the fact that when I had graduated, as we did in those days, from the middle group into the seniors, I was given a copy of the Jerusalem Bible. This was an American version, circa late 50s, in which all the colored players of biblical events and history included everyone in this Bible was white, except for Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, and the devil was black. That's the power of whiteness. Whiteness becomes virtuous. It becomes the truth. It becomes the conceptual norm. It becomes that which is the equivalent to the fish swimming in the sea that doesn't realize how its own existence is being constrained by a particular form of reality. So we have to name whiteness. But we have to do more than that. We have to deconstruct it. We have to take away its corrosive and toxic power and make it just particular like any other view of the world and experience. There's nothing wrong with the white Jesus so long as we accept that that's a contextual way of thinking that sits alongside other images of what the risen Jesus could look like. There's nothing wrong with reading Jane Austen. As I said, I have come to have a certain appreciation of her, having sort of sat through many, many. Is it Andrew Davis who does all those sort of fantastic adaptations of those plays? Well, books that get turned into sort of glossy television program. But here's the thing, which gets me onto the second point very quickly in terms of how we think about deconstruct and mission Christianity. That we have to accept that whiteness has been so conjoined with how we think about the Christian faith and its embeddedness into the framework of empire, that this form of Christianity is not neutral. It's dangerous. It's dangerous because what it propagates, it propagates power and imperialism, it propagates top-down notions of being. It's the way in which we still have a framing of the faith in which when we think about what God is like, God is represented often through the lens of cis white men. It's why our church, and this is one reason why I was so happy to accept this invitation to come and speak to a body called Inclusive Church, the reason why our churches have always struggled to be inclusive is because what we have imbibed is not the gospel as reflected through the lens of a Palestinian Jew, someone who is othered in his own context. It's because it's reflected of empire. 
It's reflective of the people who get to share Pampaya. And if I'm being honest, it's people who go to the institution where I teach. Cis white men get to control what God is like, get to create doctrines that we say are universal, that somehow never impact upon them, but always impact upon the other. And therefore part of the whole decolonizing process for me has to be the ways in which we have to challenge and critique what we have been told is normative. It's interesting how doctrines have often been fossilized for us over the case of 2000 years on the basis that this speaks of God. But actually any cursory reading of church history, which is interesting because I hated my first degree in church history. I have had to repent over the last 15, 20 years for my lack of attention as an undergrad. I was a terrible undergrad. I tell my students now in Oxford that by all means work hard, but like you're not defined by what you're like when you're 21 years old, because I was a terrible student. I missed more lectures than I went to, and I was more familiar with the bar and the student union than I was with the library. But how what I did take from the study of church history was oftentimes when we looked at how doctrine were created, there were much of political arguments as they are the so-called revealing of the Holy Spirit. Yet so many of our churches hold onto them because what they want to hold on to is a framework of categorization that wants to put people into their appropriate place and, and acknowledge that some bodies are acceptable, but some bodies are transgressive and others simply we don't want to talk about. And that's been the impact of whiteness. I've spent most of my adult career in theological education. The number of times I've sat and seen that our formational processes are largely a form of socialization into getting particular bodies to conform to a framework of authority that insists upon who can belong and who can't. I still remember sitting in my own church. If I criticize the Methodist church, it's not because we're worse than anyone else, it's just because it's the one I know I'm most familiar with because I've grown up in it. And I still remember sitting at a selection panel about 25 years ago. We met at High Lee, where some of you may have gone with, uh, to, just on the edge of London. And we sat and we were looking at candidates who were offering for ministry. And the two things that stick in my mind going back 25 years, first was a guy who had been to Cambridge, had a double first, was, was a practicing solicitor, was pretty much a functional atheist. But when we asked him a very straightforward question like, so how do you explain your call? He was very, very clever in being able to deconstruct the question without ever answering it. So when we said, what's a call? He said, well, so what is a call? That's a very, very complex question. Mm. So, you know, I mean, so in philosophical, ontological and epistemological terms, calls can be understood in a variety of ways. He went on like that for the whole of the 35 minutes. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, who is this person? And why does he want to be a Methodist minister? Because he didn't seem to have any theology or believe in anything. But at the end of it, the committee said, but wow, isn't he such an eloquent individual? seems to me that like he was quite good at BS and obfuscation <laughs> but however that was also construed as being very very intelligent and very a great sense of elucidation so we accepted him because to quote one of the people wouldn't he be such a great asset for the Methodist church to have someone like him as a minister in our church because you see part of the power of whiteness is that there is a norm, and the norm is not just cis white men, it's cis white Oxbridge men, particularly the Church of England, and every other church in dialogue with that, is caught in a, in a kind of respectability politics, where what we want is our ministers to be somehow au fait with the central power of establishment. 
in order for us to feel respected. It's why in my own church, certainly up until, well, certainly if I talked to candidates for ministry over, th over 40 years ago, they would tell you there was a time when there were elocution lessons for working class people, because if you were gonna be clergy and therefore be part of the ruling class, you had to sound a particular way. Obviously not like me. So this guy sails through because he fits the typology of what we perceive a respectable minister to look like. Male, cis, well-educated, privileged. Juxtapose that with a working class woman. It's a, it's, a, it's a warm day, so she comes with a short sleeve dress and you can see the tattoos on her arm. This is a time when tattoos were not fashionable, okay? It's body art now. In those days, it was just that, in those days, it was a vulgar thing that working class people did. And so she turned up and she was a working class woman and she was candidate to be a deacon. And she was very evangelical and very charismatic. And so, the, and, and so that first same question explained to us the nature of your call, she told us this story. And the story was that in her previous life, she had been a sex worker. So you can imagine how well that is gonna go down now with the very, very polite and bourgeois middle-class group of people who are choosing who's gonna be a minister or a deacon to represent Christ in Christ's church, in his church. So she talks about being a sex worker and, she, and she's in bed with her client. And suddenly Jesus comes in, breaks through her door on a surfboard of fire. And as she's telling her story, you can see the eyes proverbially and literally rolling in people's heads thinking, what kind of crazy woman is this? Who wants to come with her tattoo with arms and telling us about Jesus on a surfboard of fire, having been a sex worker. So we turned her down because she didn't fit the typology. But here's a rub. At the end of it, we then said our prayers, convinced of, all, convinced of everything we had done was in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. I submit that what we did was in the power of whiteness. A kind of respectability politics that says who belongs and who doesn't. And to be fair, there were a fair number of black and Asian people in the room as well, because what whiteness is, according to Genesis, is not just something that's about people who racialize as white. We know the way in which many communities from various parts of the empire have internalized the tropes of whiteness, that you end up reproducing it long after the white people have gone. In many of the former colonies, for example, all the laws against homosexuality were passed by the British, not by the so-called natives. And long after they had left, the people who are still policing those laws are not the colonial masters anymore. They're the people who have now internalized that because that is what proper Christianity looks like. So deconstructing whites and deconstructing mission Christianity, I submit is not just an intellectual enterprise done by people like myself who like to write books that for the most part people don't read. It's actually, it's for me, it is the way in which we bring an element of authenticity back to this corrupted enterprise that has lost its way for over a thousand years. Now here's the good news. There's always been a remnant that has been pushing back against all of this. That at various points there have been reform movements, not reformed in the traditional theological sense around how we understand the scriptures or how we think about theological methods and the way in which we think about what is authority. But reformed in the sense in which a reminder of that at the heart of our faith is a person who himself was persecuted in his own context, a, Gal a Galilean Palestinian Jew, a person who himself was transgressive even within his own particular context in terms of what happens to him. It's very interesting in that when 
we look at the development of Christendom, we quickly worked out that Pontius Pilate wasn't the villain. It was Jesus' own Jewish people that somehow killed him. So we end up with the, the dangers of anti-Semitism, which again, thinking about whiteness, comes out of a way in which Gentile Christianity becomes the people of God. And Jewishness gets pushed to one side as being the other. So we end up with a white Aryan Jesus who looks more like Bjorn Borg than Bjorn Borg looks like Bjorn Borg. And there's not one hint of Jewishness about it. Christian supersessionism is what then allows the empire to say, well, it's the Jews who killed Jesus, when it's clearly obvious that if you read any of the four Gospels, it's the Romans who killed him. But why don't we want to name the Romans as the villains? Because the minute Britain becomes an imperial power and ends up appointing its own versions of Pontius Pilate in various parts of the world, there's no longer any great appetite to name the Romans as the villains because if we do that, what we're really doing is convicting ourselves. Britain, the holder of the largest empire the world has ever seen. 44,000 square miles of country controls 24% of the world on which the sun literally never set. So in conclusion, Deconstructing whiteness is a must in order to have a form of Christianity that has credibility and authenticity in a world in which we are still wrestling with the residues of empire and colonialism, of top-down power, of the constriction of bodies, of the categorization under the rubric of race, where race is a false consciousness. Race does not exist. There's only one race, that's the human race. And yet the way in which race is infected into the body politic, not only of nations, but most crucially of the church and Christianity, that has meant that rather than being a form of resistance against all that I've just said, the church happily colluded with it for the most part. And the reality is now that we find some of the fastest growing and most popular versions of church often ones that are most adept at, re at reiterating and reinscribing all those elements of whiteness that we need to resist and we need to repel. Finally, the way in which we do that is by always taking seriously those voices on the margins. A huge, a hugely significant book that I constantly read and reread is a book of that same title by by post-colonial Sri Lankan scholar called R.S. Sugatha Raja, Voices from the Margin. And in Voices from the Margin, what Sugatha Raja does, he brings together the wonderful cast of scholars from the global majority. And they reread and reinterpret biblical texts from the perspective of the margin. It's one of the earliest iterations of a post-colonial anti-imperial anti text that says, that if Christianity is going to regain its sense of authenticity, we need to hear the voices from the margins that are talking back to the power of whites, talking back to the power of empire, talking back to the constriction of respectability politics that clothes some bodies as being more of Christ and other bodies and other people as being the other who are not worth considering. Until that happens, I think our faith will always be compromised. We will always be on the wrong side of the historical argument. We will be more analogous to a Pontius Pilate than we are to a Palestinian Jew, whose earliest ministry amongst a group of people on the margins of empire was to speak truth to power and not to collude with it. Part of the good news, I think, of inclusive church is that at your best, I want to believe that what you're trying to do you know, are the very things that I'm speaking of. But recognize that deconstructing whiteness is an incredibly difficult thing to do because of the way in which it has so infected our way of being. 
but it's not impossible. Thank you very much.